Well, welcome back. This session and the next are, being, are going to be devoted to obstructive diseases of the lung. These are major causes of morbidity and mortality and so are extremely important. In this session we're going to look at chronic obstructive lung disease and in the next we'll go to asthma and localized airway obstruction. Now chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD as we'll call it, is extremely common. In fact, it's the third most important cause of death after uh, cancer and heart disease. <clears throat> and one of the tragic features of this disease is that much of it is preventable. It's essentially caused by smoking and it's a terrible indictment that this scourge remains as it does. Now all these diseases are going to be uh, linked with obstruction to the airways and so let's look at three mechanisms of airway obstruction. On the left we can see an airway which is partly occluded by material within it that could be retained secretions as in chronic bronchitis, mucus plugs as in asthma, uh, edema fluid as in pulmonary edema, aspiration of material postoperatively, or maybe an inhaled foreign body, for example a peanut in a toddler. All these obviously could cause airway obstruction. The next, uh, in the center here, is obstruction caused by an increase in thickness of the airway wall. This can cause, be caused by inflammation, for example in chronic bronchitis or asthma. Also there can be hypertrophy of bronchial smooth muscle and asthma or hypertrophy of bronchial mucous glands in chronic bronchitis. All these can increase the thickness of the airway wall. And then finally in C here we see a slightly different situation <coughs> and this reminds us that the caliber of an airway depends on two factors. One is its intrinsic mechanisms that, are, that can make it smaller, for example the, the uh, smooth muscle in the wall with tone and the elastic tissue, and, and the other is the radial traction of the alveolar walls around it. These tend to pull it open, so that if the alveolar walls are destroyed, as they are in emphysema, then this radial traction is lost and the airway becomes smaller. Now let's turn to COPD and this image makes the point that most patients with COPD are a mixture of emphysema and chronic bronchitis. And often it's not at all clear as to how much of each a given patient has. There are situations, for example a relatively young man, a 40 year old, who has alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, is a non-smoker, has no cough, that person is likely to have a relatively pure emphysema, but most patients with COPD have a mixture. And therefore we use, and, and these patients often have shortness of breath over a series of years, uh, chronic cough, reduced exercise tolerance, airway obstruction, overinflated lungs, and impaired gas exchange. And we use the term COPD as a convenient, nondescript label that avoids making an unwarranted diagnosis with inadequate data. <clears throat> now occasionally it's useful to have a formal definition of a disease and this is the definition that's often accepted for emphysema. It's a disease that's characterized by enlargement of the air spaces distal to the terminal bronchiole with destruction of their walls. Now that leads us to remind ourselves of the terminal bronchiole and here's a diagram of the airway system, the Weibel model that we've referred to several times uh, previously. And you'll recall that the terminal bronchiole is the smallest of the conducting airways, shown here. And this subtends or supplies the asinus or the unit of gas exchange. And so the disease in emphysema is distal to the terminal bronchiole. Therefore it's in the parenchyma of the lung rather than in the larger airways. 
Now it turns out the histology of emphysema is very instructive. And uh, this is shown here. At the top we've got the histology of the normal lung, a thin, uh, thin lung, lung section. And you can see the alveolar ducts and the alveoli very clearly. And now we go to the lower image and you can see this terrible destruction that occurs in emphysema. With breakdown of the alveolar walls, large amounts of the capillary bed of course are destroyed because the capillaries run in the alveolar walls. And you can also see that these small blood vessels here, one here and one here, lack the normal radial traction of the parenchyma around them. And that would be also true of the airways. So that's a, uh, a striking example of emphysema. And here's another one uh, which is made in a slightly different way. A uh, the lung has been fixed and a has been sliced and has been looked at with a hand lens. And in this upper image here you can see the uh, alveolar ducts and alveoli. Uh, the alveoli about a third of a micron in diameter. We can just pick them out at this magnification. And uh, down here we have a uh, typical appearance of emphysema, breakdown of the alveolar walls, complete disorganization of the lung structure. And therefore you can see how um, a large number of pathophysiological processes would follow. And I think it's very useful to keep these appearances at the back of our mind when we think about lung function in emphysema. Now it turns out that the distribution of emphysema in the asinus varies. On the left we see the normal drawing with a terminal bronchiole here, the respiratory bronchioles and the alveoli. And in centriacina emphysema here, the disease is limited to the center of the asinus as you can see. And the alveoli in the periphery are spared. Contrast that with panacena emphysema, where the disease uh, occurs throughout the whole of the asinus. So these are, are very different patterns. Now what could be responsible for the pattern in centriacena emphysema? Well, we've talked before about the fact that when pollutants are inhaled uh, as aerosols, they reach the terminal bronchioles by convective flow, like beer being poured out of a pitcher, uh, but they don't get to the peripheral alveoli easily, in fact they don't get there at all, because they don't diffuse rapidly enough in the gas phase. In, in the asinus, the primary mode of transport is diffusion in the gas phase, <coughs> and the pollutants tend to therefore settle out in the center of the asinus. And that would be a, quite a reasonable explanation of why this uh, disease occurs in this way. Let me rem remind you, we've seen this slide before, of the location of dust in a coal miner's lung. And this makes the same point, that the dust tends to occur in the center of the asinus. The asinus, the edge of it is around here somewhere. And you can see it's located in the uh, terminal respiratory bronchioles here, and the alveoli are completely spared. And the same thing is shown in this drawing at the top here. So this is a dramatic demonstration of the fact that the center of the asinus is very much at risk. Now what about the situation in panacena emphysema? Why do we see a different pattern there? Well, I presume that the mechanism of, of, of disease, the pathogenetic process, is different in panacena emphysema. And it may be that it has to do with an imbalance of the protease antiprotease system that we're going to be talking about in more detail in a few minutes. So let's leave it until then. And, and that th this disease depends on the distribution of blood flow, not the, the deposition of pollutants as in centriacena emphysema. Now it turns out that centriacena emphysema has an interesting topographical distribution in the lung, and you can see this very clearly here. Severe emphysema at the apex of the lung, less as we go down, and the, bases are, the base of the lung is, reason, is essentially spared. Now what's the reason for that? Well, I think an explanation is as shown here, and we've talked about this previously in the respiratory physiology sequence, uh, 
The, on the, this side, we can see that because of gravitational factors, the blood flow is different, uh, being lower at the top of the lung than the bottom, and the ventilation is also different, but rather uh, a smaller uh, difference, and therefore the ventilation perfusion ratio is high, and there are differences in the PO2 and PCO2. On this side, we can see what happens because the lung is distorted by its own weight. And as a result, the alveoli are large at the top of the lung. The transpulmonary pressures are greater. Uh, that is to say, the difference between alveolar and intrapleural pressure is greater. And the stresses are higher. The mechanical stresses in the lung are greater. And you may have airway closure at the bottom of the lung because of this distortion. Now, it makes sense that if you've got some disease throughout the lung, a deposition of pollutants throughout the lung, as we see here, uh, <clears throat> as you could imagine here, then the lung will fail first where it's stressed most. The stresses are highest at the apex, and that, I think, is a reasonable explanation for the distribution of centriacina emphysema. Now, there are other types of emphysema as well, and uh, this shows an example of what's called paraseptal emphysema. In this case, the damage is seen adjacent to fibrous septa in the lung that separate the lobules. And the engineers have a term for this kind of thing. It's called stress concentration. And what this means is that if you've got an expandable material like the lung adjacent to something that does not expand, then you get a concentration of stresses here. And that's probably a reasonable explanation for the location of paraseptal emphysema. You can also get what's called bullous emphysema, as shown here. Large balloon-like uh, structures occur, often at the top of the lung, though not always, and probably the high stresses in this region are in part responsible for this. Now there's another type of distribution that's shown here, and that is emphysema, which is, tends to occur principally in the lower regions of the lung. And that's often seen in this disease, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Now this is an uncommon disease, but of particular interest because of the light that it possibly throws on the mechanisms of other types of emphysema. In alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which is a heritable disease, patients with, who are homozygous for the ZZ gene develop this disease at a relatively early age. By that I mean perhaps in their 40s. Uh, they may be non-smokers uh, and uh, have no bronchitis at all, and yet they develop uh, this disease. And it tends to occur at the bottom of the lung uh, presumably because that's where the blood flow is highest and that's where the uh, trypsins are, uh, are uh, uh, located uh, because of the high blood flow and, and the absence of antitrypsin causes destruction to occur. And this interesting disease, uh, first of all, it can be shown <coughs> by a, an electrophoretic pattern here where you can see the absence of the uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin uh, marking here. And this disease suggests a pa possible pathogenesis of emphysema generally. In these patients, uh, almost certainly, the disease is caused by an imbalance between the protease, the trypsin, and the antiprotease, the antitrypsin. And it's tempting to think that this may be true of other types of, of emphysema as well. We know, for example, that cigarette smoking results in the release of neutrophil elastase. Neutrophils contain large amounts of elastase because they, uh, uh, they use the uh, enzyme to break down bacteria and so on that they engulf. Uh, and elastase is perhaps a misleading term because not only does it attack elastin, but it also cleaves collagen as well. So it's actually a collagenase as well as an elastase. And it seems likely that, that cigarette smoking, because it releases neutrophil elastase, uh, may cause an imbalance between the protease and, and antiproteases in the lung. Uh, we know that neutrophils, uh, 
uh, marginated in, in uh, capillaries in the lung, that happens under normal conditions, and there's some, in other words, they tend to be held up in the capillaries of the lung, and there's some evidence that uh, smokers have increased margination of their leukocytes, including their neutrophils. So this may be part of the mechanism of this. Now, of course, if you've got breakdown of the collagen in the lung, then clearly the lung is very vulnerable. And one of the questions may be, what is the most vulnerable region of the lung? And I think that the blood gas barrier is a good candidate for that. Here we have an electron micrograph of a pulmonary capillary that we've seen now a number of times before, just to remind you of the extremely thin blood gas barrier on one side. And here's an electron micrograph showing a very high power view of just a portion of the barrier. This little portion here has been blown up. And what's interesting about the blood gas barrier is that in the extracellular matrix, it, between the epithelium and the endothelium, you have an extremely thin layer of type 4 collagen, indicated by the arrow here. Actually, you can see this electron-dense layer in the center of the extracellular matrix. We believe that's responsible for the strength of the barrier, and so this looks like an extremely vulnerable region which may be destroyed if there is a protease that is not uh, is unaffected by the antiprotease. There's an imbalance between the two. That's a hypothesis, but I think it's an interesting one. Now let's move from emphysema to chronic bronchitis, the second of the two diseases. And let's have a definition. And the definition is that it's a disease characterized by excessive mucus production in the bronchial tree, sufficient to cause excessive ex expectoration of sputum. And I should say with modern antibiotic therapy, we don't see so much expectoration as we did in the good old days, but it still occurs. You'll notice that, notice that this is a clinical definition, as opposed to the definition of emphysema, which was anatomical, a breakdown of the alveolar walls, increase in air spaces distal to the terminal bronchial. And, and you may say, well, how do we know if a person's got emphysema, if we need to see uh, an anatomical evidence of it? Well, of course, we don't normally have that. But now with modern imaging techniques, we can get a very good idea if emphysema is present. But chronic bronchitis is a clinical definition, and it has to do with the mucous glands in the bronchial wall. And this is a drawing to remind us of the mucous glands which are situated between the epithelium of this airway here and the cartilage here. And you can see the mucous glands clearly. And the, you can also see some arrows here. And this is just to indicate that you can actually measure the amount of the mucous glands by this distance here divided by the total distance here, BC divided by AD. So this is the normal appearance of mucous glands in the airway wall. And just to remind you of the function of mucus, of course, the mucus is deposited onto the airway wall and swept along by the mucociliary escalator, and that's the way in which dust particles are removed from the lung. So the mucociliary escalator is a critical factor in maintaining the cleanliness of the large airways. And uh, the mucus, by the way, not only comes from the mucus glands that I showed you in the previous slide here, with their duct leading the mucus to the surface, but also goblet cells that I located in the bronchial wall epithelium here. Now we saw the normal uh, appearance of mucus, and look at this remarkable uh, micrographs, these remarkable micrographs here. First of all, here's the normal situation. Here's the airway epithelium, the lumen of the airway is here. Here's the cartilage, and here's the layer of mucus glands, or sometimes called seromucus glands. Okay, quite clearly seen. Now go down to this remarkable picture in chronic bronchitis. You can see the whole of the, this region of the airway is occupied by hypertrophied mucus glands. Here's the epithelium here. Here is the uh, cartilage here. 
and this enormous hypertrophy of the mucous gland. So that's characteristic of chronic bronchitis. So what happens is these hypertrophied mucous glands secrete very large amounts of mucus in response to the inhaled pollutant, generally cigarette smoke, and these very large amounts of mucus on the airway walls completely overwhelm the mucociliary escalator. You may remember that we talked about the, the critical importance of maintaining the, the thicknesses of the two layers of the mucus, the sol layer and the gel layer of the mucus. And obviously, if you're going to produce vast amounts of mucus with these abnormally hypertrophy mucus glands, you're going to interfere with the function of the mucociliary escalator. And that's what happens in chronic bronchitis. Now we've been looking at the large airways, but it's very important to realize that in chronic bronchitis, there are important changes in the small airways. In fact, that is probably where the first changes occur, as we were talking about uh, when we mentioned the deposition of pollutants. The pollutants tend to deposit in the small airways. And histological uh, pictures show that in the small airways of people with chronic bronchitis, you've got inflammation of the airways, edema of their walls, that's part of the inflammation, narrowing of the airways, you've got cellular infiltration, and you can also get some peribronchial fibrosis. So the changes in the small airways are critically important, and uh, we'll say a little bit more about those later on. Now, what causes these changes in chronic bronchitis? Well, of course, it's the inhaled pollutants, and I just want to show you the dramatic effects of the inhalation of a single cigarette, a smoke from a single cigarette, on airway conductance. Airway conductance is the reciprocal of, uh, of uh, resistance. So this means that the conductance of the airway here, here's a cigarette, is the smoke here, uh, and then look at the tremendous, terrific reduction in airway conductance, and this lasts for an hour or so, just a single cigarette. So uh, this stuff is really toxic, and uh, we should do everything we can to get rid of this terrible scourge of smoking. Now let's talk a little bit about the clinical presentations in COPD. <coughs> And the vast majority of patients have a sort of mixed presentation, but it's very interesting that there are extremes called the type A and type B that we will, that are interesting to look at. And the type A patient shown here on the left is typically a, a rather thin person sitting up in bed, as you can see, and desperately short of breath. He's very dyspneic because his ventilation is high and his, his high ventilation allows him to maintain an, an almost normal arterial PO2. Uh, it's never completely normal, of course, but uh, it's not grossly reduced. And his PCO2 will be normal, but he will be desperately short of breath, and it's a, some, it's a pitiful sight to see a patient uh, with a pure type A who is very short of breath. He has large lungs, as we'll see in a moment, and uh, this is a good opportunity to look at the radiographs of a patient with emphysema. Here's a normal radiograph on the left here. And on the right, you can see a typical radiograph in severe emphysema. You can see that the chest is overinflated. The ribs are uh, more horizontal on this side than over here. You can see that the diaphragms are low. Uh, the mediastinum is narrow. And the lung fields are over-penetrated. Now, it, you know, you need to see good films and they don't reproduce very well, but the lung fields are over-penetrated here. And if you have films that can show the small blood vessels, as you can in a digital radiograph, you can see the small blood vessels here. This is a normal digital uh, chest radiograph. You can see the small vessels, and in a patient with emphysema, these vessels disappear because of the destruction of the alveolar walls. We can also see with digital techniques the changes in emphysema. And this is a CT scan. And if you look carefully here, you can see the small holes caused by the emphysematous process here. Okay. And that's the destruction of the alveolar wall. And incidentally, on this beautiful CT, 
you can also see paraseptal emphysema here. I can see it anyway, and here. And uh, this is, um, uh, so these are changes in emphysema. So the point I was making is that, that while we, in principle, we need a, uh, a histologic picture of emphysema because it's an anatomical definition. In fact, with modern, uh, uh, highly sophisticated uh, imaging techniques like this, we can see the changes in emphysema without a problem. So that was the type A presentation. Now let's look at the type B presentation. It was a, a very different kind of person. This man probably has a very long history of cigarette smoking and he has severe chronic bronchitis. Uh, he's coughing up uh, phlegm all the time. In fact, the artist has put a couple of sputum pots here, to collect that. He tends to be lying back in bed. Um, he's, uh, uh, he, he's not nearly as short of breath as this man here, uh, but he's blue, he's cyanotic, his blood gases are very abnormal. He has a much lower PO2 than this man, and he probably has uh, an increased PCO2, sometimes called respiratory failure. He also has evidence of right heart failure. He has an increased pulmonary artery pressure, pulmonary hypertension, got evidence of heart failure with the triad of, of engorged neck veins, palpable liver, and uh, peripheral edema. And uh, this is the type B type of presentation. And as I said earlier on, many patients, most patients, of course, are a mixture of the two, but it's interesting to look at these two extremes here. So the type A patient is the fighter. He is unwilling to see his PCO2 rise, and we talked about this before, if the PCO2 rises, it alters the pH of the blood, changes the, the function of enzymes, configuration of proteins, has effects on the central nervous system. So. Often patients fight hard to maintain their PCO2 normal. As a result, he's called a fighter and sometimes called a pink puffer. Medical students can always remember that. A pink puffer, pink because he's not cyanized and puffing because he's breathing so hard. By contrast, the type B patients can be called quitters. They are people who have elected not to try and keep their PCO2 at the normal level because the, the, the dyspnea associated with that is so unpleasant. And, and if you like, they've traded an increased PCO2 for a better life in not breathing so hard. And they're called the blue bloaters. They're blue because they're cyanosed and they're bloated and they have some uh, water retention as well. And those are the typical, those are the classical definitions, uh, descriptions of the type A and type B patients. Now let's move to pulmonary function in COPD. And the first thing to say here is keep an, at the back of your mind the uh, histological appearances that I showed before, because often we can predict the kinds of changes. And the ventilatory ca capacity and mechanics are, uh, of course, are grossly uh, affected. And the main problem with COPD is airway obstruction. And we're all familiar now with the forced expiration, the normal pattern shown here, and the obstructive pattern where the FEV1 is grossly reduced because of the very severe airway obstruction. The FVC is also lower, and this is because the diseased airways close prematurely towards the end of the expiration. The cause of the obstruction is dynamic compression of the airways. We talked about that in the previous session where we talked about pulmonary function tests and I talked about it extensively in the respiratory physiology series. I'm not going to go into the mechanism of it now, but it's of course extremely important. And the, 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 the carry home message is that during dynamic compression of the airways, airflow is, is independent of effort. There's no way the patient can increase his effort. Another way that we frequently look at the obstruction is by plotting flow volume curves shown here. And the typical obstructive pattern shows a scooped out appearance and these very low flow rates. 
at, at low lung volumes. See, we're exhaling here from TLC down to residual volume. And at these very low lung volumes, flow rate is principally determined by the very small airways. And in chronic bronchitis, these, as we've seen, are diseased. Let's look at lung volumes in COPD. They are typically all increased. The total lung capacity, functional residual capacity, and residual volume are all typically greatly increased. And in addition, when we make the measurements of lung volumes, and if we do this using both the helium dilution and the body box, or the plethysmograph, we see a difference between the two measurements. Because the helium dilution technique only measures the volume of the lung which is connected to the mouth. But there may be obstructed airways here, uh, or there may be airways uh, where the, the rate of, of mixing of the helium is terribly slow because of uneven ventilation. And whereas the body box measures the total volume of gas in the lung, the helium dilution will give you a smaller number because not all the uh, not all the section of the lung are communicating with the mouth. The reason for the high lung volumes is the abnormal pressure volume curves in emphysema. And here we can see <coughs> the volume here uh, plotted against the transpulmonary pressure here. And in emphysema, you've got an increased volume for the same pressure and a steeper slope here. Uh, compare that with the normal, which is the red line here, and uh, interstitial fibrosis gives you a very stiff lung, as you can see. Why the emphysematous lung has a high compliance, uh, I like to think of it really that what we've done is we have destroyed the architecture of the lung, and therefore we've destroyed the ability of the lung to have its normal recoil. I think that's probably the simplest way of thinking about it, and of course it's not surprising when we see a picture like this uh, where the architecture is destroyed. Gas exchange in COPD is grossly impaired, of course. Obviously, with the destruction of the architecture I've just shown, there has to be extensive ventilation perfusion inequality. There's no way that that lung can be ventilated and perfused in the normal way. And so all these patients have hypoxemia, and some of them have CO2 retention. Now, I'm not going to go into this whole question of CO2, PCO2 in COPD. We've talked about it previously. Um, just to remind you that ventilation perfusion inequality interferes with the transfer of carbon dioxide by the lung. The AQ inequality interfere, it makes the lung inefficient at gas exchange for all gases, including CO2. And the only reason why we see many patients with COPD, COPD for example, our type A patient that we saw a couple of slides back, the only reason why we see these patients with a normal PCO2 is that they've been able to bring the CO2 down, as it were, b b below what it would be if they didn't hyperventilate, by increasing the ventilation to their alveoli. So patients with ventilation perfusion inequality would have CO2 retention if they did not increase the ventilation to their alveoli. And the type B patient, as we said before, often will allow his PCO2 to rise because he cannot cope with the severe dyspnea. He's willing to trade an increase in PCO2 for a slightly lower ventilation, which will make him very much more comfortable. The ventilation perfusion inequality, of course, increases the alveolar arterial PO2 difference. And if you calculate the physiologic dead space and the physiologic shunt, these are also increased. It's possible to look at the pattern of ventilation perfusion inequality in patients with COPD. Uh, we don't do it in the pulmonary function laboratory setting, but in a research setting it can be done. And this is the normal distribution of ventilation perfusion ratios that we've seen previously. Ventilation and blood flow on this axis against ventilation perfusion ratio here. And as you might expect in the normal lung, all the ventilation and blood flow are are uh, situated close to the normal ventilation perfusion ratio of, of about one. But now look what happens in a typical type A patient. 
What you see is a normal mode here, if you like, not far from one, but an abnormal mode with a large amount of ventilation going to lung units with very high ventilation perfusion ratios. Presumably, those are regions of the lung where the capillaries have been destroyed by the emphysematous process, but ventilation is still taking place. And this uh, reflects a very high physiologic dead space. And this type A patient is not likely to have much hypoxemia because there's not much blood flow going to very low ventilation perfusion ratio units. But now if we look at the type B patient, we see a completely different situation. Again, the reasonably normal mode here, but now a mode showing a large amount of blood flow going to lung units with very low ventilation perfusion ratios. And presumably these are the units behind uh, grossly diseased airways, which cause obstruction to ventilation. The ventilation is greatly reduced. The blood flow is still occurring through these regions. And this is responsible for the, for the cyanosis, uh, the very low arterial PO2 in the type B patient. Incidentally, notice that in spite of this very severe disease, there's no shunt, no blood flow to unventilated alveoli. That was a big surprise to us when we first found that. Uh, it's not always the case that there's no shunt, but there always is re relatively little shunt in these patients. And I think it probably has to do with collateral ventilation, which is allowing some ventilation to these alveoli, uh, but not through the usual channels. Let's look briefly at the pulmonary circulation in COPD. It's abnormal. These patients, particularly the type B patients, develop pulmonary hypertension. And that has several causes. One, of course, is just the destruction of the capillary bed. Many of the capillaries, which are in the walls of the alveoli, are destroyed. In addition, there's hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction because of the low alveolar PO2 in low VAQ areas. And just to remind you, hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction means that in a poorly ventilated region, because of an obstruction here, the blood flow to that region is reduced. In addition, these patients often have some polycythemia uh, it's a minor effect, I think, increasing blood viscosity. And also, there are pathological changes in the walls of the small arteries. Patients with pulmonary hypertension often develop right heart failure with fluid retention, dependent edema, and the right heart enlargement can be seen both in the ECG and with more difficulty in the chest X-ray. So these patients uh, develop pulmonary hypertension and a patient with, particularly with the type B type of presentation, who develops pulmonary hypertension with CO2 retention, uh, the, the, pro those, that, uh, the prognosis in that case is relatively poor. These patients have a very high work of breathing. Now, of course, that's not surprising. They've got severe obstruction to the airways. And so it takes a lot of oxygen to, 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 uh, to the respiratory muscles for these patients to ventilate. And one way of demonstrating that is shown here. We can ask normal subjects to voluntarily hyperventilate. And if we do that, they increase their ventilation to, say, 80 liters a minute. There's almost no increase in the total oxygen uptake of a normal subject if he increases his ventilation to 80 liters a minute, say. But look at the patient with COPD. The moment he is asked to hyperventilate, uh, which he finds very difficult to do, of course, because of the dynamic compression of his airways, but he, he tries to hyperventilate and enormous oxygen uptake, and that simply just reflects the tremendous uh, work of breathing in these patients. Now, there's a lot of interest in trying to detect changes in early disease because unfortunately, particularly in, in emphysema, once we get breakdown of the alveolar walls, there's nothing you can do about that. And in general, patients with COPD uh, uh, do not respond to therapy uh, particularly well. And so the hope is to catch these patients in an early stage. Now, what we'd like to do with chronic bronchitis 
is to pick up the increased resistance of the small airways at an early stage. Difficult to do because, as we've said several times now, the small airways constitute a silent zone. The, the amount of airway resistance in the small airways in the normal lung is very small. So it's difficult to pick up the an increase in resistance of the small airways. And possible ways of doing that include the closing volume, which we've talked about before, and the flow volume curve. And this is just to remind you again of the flow volume curve and the fact that when we get down to these lower regions of the flow volume curve here, the flow rate is increasingly dependent on the very small airways. So that gives us some indication. What about the management, the treatment in COPD? Well, unfortunately, the destruction of lung tissue is irreversible. Uh, apart from transplanting a lung, there's nothing much you can do about the, the destruction of the lung tissue in uh, emphysema. For bronchitis, of course, you use antibiotics uh, as, as, as much as you can, uh, both to treat the bronchitis and particularly to prevent uh, exacerbations. And some patients with chronic bronchitis have reversible bronchoconstriction. And of course, their bronchodilators will be used. In fact, some physicians now routinely use bronchodilators in all cases of chronic bronchitis, in all cases of COPD, uh, because there may be some reversible uh, bronchoconstriction and uh, uh, you're not going to do any harm by giving bronchodilators. The, the pulmonary hypertension can be uh, treated to some extent by continuous oxygen therapy and that's used via nasal cannulas for patients who have uh, a very low arterial PO2 and uh, uh, developing pulmonary hypertension because the prognosis of these patients is linked to, in, in many of these patients, is linked to pulmonary hypertension. Other patients can have portable oxygen that can improve their mobility and often you've, you've seen patients, now you can use liquid oxygen containers, nasal cannulas and patient can go shopping, go to the movies and so on. Lung volume reduction surgery is available for some patients and uh, that can improve the quality of life over a, a period. And also rehabilitation programs are important. Rehabilitation programs probably don't greatly change pulmonary function or even exercise capacity, although they may to some extent. But the attitude of the patient to his or her disease is very, very important and rehabilitation programs can be uh, critically important there. Well, that's all I'm going to say about COPD, a desperately important subject. Uh, let me just finish, though, by saying that I think we all have an obligation to try and prevent uh, smoking, try and get rid of this awful scourge of cigarette smoking. We're making good progress, uh, I should say, particularly here in California, uh, but it's desperately important that we get rid of smoking because it's responsible for a very large amount of, these, of this terrible disease, COPD. And I'll leave it there and look forward to seeing you next time.